Good evening. Hi. Namaste. Thanks for coming tonight. I would like to take you on a journey, on a voyage. Last week I talked about an airplane leaving Tampa, going to Denver. And at the last minute, the captain decides, you know what, I'm going to change course by one degree. What do you think is going to happen? We'll never make it to Denver. Yeah, that's for sure. We'll make it hundreds, if not thousands of miles from that originated destination. So tonight, I'm asking you to start, many of you, hopefully, all of you have already started the journey and changing, making changes to your lifestyle. If you're not happy with the results you're currently getting, obviously something has to change, right? There's a great work quote from Lisa Jimenez from her uh, book, Conquer Fear, that says, if you want, when you change your beliefs, you change your behaviors. When you change your behaviors, you change your outcome. And when you change the outcome, you change your life. So think about, as we're going through the presentation tonight, this is kind of an overview of what, is, what are the elements, what are the pillars to health. Think about, in various aspects of those pillars, what is the one degree of change that you can make? Because just like the flight that originally was supposed to go to Denver is the longevity that makes the difference. In the beginning, we may not see many changes, right? But as we make those changes day in, day out, we're going to be much further away from the original destination. All right? So, another analogy to flying. Anybody has ever flown on a commercial airliner? Yeah, right? So, as they're doing the safety speech, what do they talk about? In case of an emergency, what do we do? Put the oxygen on ourselves first. Yes! The pressure on the, cab uh, the cabin may drop down and the oxygen mask is going to drop right in front of us. And before we assist anybody else, if we're traveling to our children, they advise us to put the mask on ourselves first. Why? When I taught this class to a bunch of 10-year-olds, there was this little girl who looked at me like I had a third eye. It's like, well, Isabel, you can't help anybody if you're dead. <laughs> they said, right answer, of course. So think about it. Are you taking care of a family? Do you have a business? Do you work in the community? Who needs you? Any moms in the room? Mm -hmm. Moms tend to put everybody else first. Right? I see heads going like this. And then we put ourselves last. We feel guilty if we go for a massage. Right? Maybe not. But the point is, if you do not take care of yourself first, you're no good to anybody. So tonight, we're going to talk about what needs to happen in order for us to be strong, so that we can help others be strong as well. Sounds good? All right. So it all starts with information disclaimer. <laughs> the information we're sharing here is not meant for any uh, medical specific condition that we can take care of in an audience. Uh, for that, you refer to your physician or we can do one-on-one -on -one sessions together. So it starts with the thoughts. Now when I talk about thoughts, broadly, this is also our emotions, the spirit, 
what goes between those two ears that affects our body and our lives. So, for this little demonstration, I'm going to need a volunteer to come on stage and join me. Oh, we have a volunteer. Awesome. Come on up, sir. Give this man a round of applause. What's your name? Steve. Steve, thanks for coming. Um, are you left-handed or right-handed? Left. Okay, so you have more strength in your left arm, you would say? Yeah, probably. Probably? Okay, awesome. So, um, I would like you to face the audience. Smile, you're on camera. <laughs> and I would like you to hold your arm straight out, your left arm straight out, horizontally here. And I want you to think of something that makes you very, very happy. You don't have to tell us, you just think about it. Okay. Okay? And when you're there, uh, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to pull your arm down, but your job is to resist me so that your arm is nice and straight. Okay. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, man. That man is strong. Wow. <laughs> You All right. Didn't, you didn't try very hard. Let's try again then. All right. Okay. Look at the audience. Think about positive thinking. You're strong. Okay. Now I want you to think of something very sad or upsetting. You don't have to tell me. Okay. But I want you to look at the audience and you're going to keep your arm up just the same way. Okay. Think about that negative, upsetting thought, and I'm going to put your, pull your arm down, okay? Mm -hmm. You ready? Yep. Are you resisting me? You're thinking you're upsetting thoughts? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to pull your arm down, but remember you need to resist me, okay? What's happening to you, Steve? Getting weaker. <laughs> I don't believe so. Actually, you got weaker, but we're going to find out why in just a moment. Okay. Get that arm back up for me. Demanding. All right. Go back to that happy place where you were before. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you've got a big smile on your face. It's a very happy place. Okay. I'm going to pull, push your arm down again, and you need to resist me. I want this arm to stay straight. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow, so you're strong again. Thank you very much. Welcome. Give this man a round of applause. So what have I just demonstrated? That I have superpowers. Yes. Eh, wrong answer. <laughs> Yeah, it's called muscle testing, but basically what that is, is our mind, our thoughts, impact every single cell in the body. And because the brain is the CEO of what's going on in the neuromuscular system, when that is weak, the rest of the body is weak. So, that's very powerful. Our thoughts impact everything inside us. Now, this demonstration, you can do it as well. I don't have any superpowers. Well, I do actually, but... If you ever do this demonstration, it is absolutely crucial that you leave the person on the positive thoughts. You do not want that person to carry that negative energy through the day. All right? So for the sake of time, we're not going to do more demonstrations like this. But if I had Steve here, and I had you all think negative thoughts towards him, 
and he thinks about nothing, he would get weak. If everybody got together thinking positive thoughts towards him, he would get strong. We already know that. Why do we pray? Why do we meditate? Why do we send flowers to people who are sick, cards? We send positive thoughts towards them. We send healing vibes towards them, right? So the power of thoughts is very powerful. Now, as I talk about each pillar, you're going to see how they all connect and how sometimes when we have one that is weak, there are 10 pillars we're going to talk about tonight. They're not always all 100% all the time. So when one, two, or more are weak, how can we tap into the others to build us back up? And this is why I love the work of community. Whether it's a friend, the family, the town, it's still a community. We can't do it alone. Would you agree? Awesome. So when we're mindful of our thoughts, it can be very powerful. And I encourage you and challenge you through the day to be aware of how many negative thoughts you have. I can tell you the most negative thoughts I ever have is when I drive. <laughs> and it's a challenge. But I'm mindful, and when somebody cuts me off, I'm like, I hope you stay in peace and you don't injure anybody, including yourself. Stay safe. It's a practice, and let me tell you, it's challenging. But by doing so, I'm helping this person change their behavior. It might be slightly, but I do understand the power of thoughts and the power of intentions. So, we do this towards ourselves. Have you ever done something silly and then you say things to yourself that are very negative? Of course. So be mindful of this. If a friend just told you exactly what you just told yourself, would that friend still be your friend? Probably not. Yeah. So think about it. All right, we'll talk more about thoughts in subsequent sessions. Each week, one of us is going to be diving in more into each pillar. But today, I just wanted to kind of give you like a little hint. Sounds good? The second one is breath. How many minutes can we live without breathing? How many minutes the brain can function without any oxygen? Three. Three minutes. After that, the brain is going to start deteriorating. And this is why when you have emergencies, being able to do CPR and first aid very quick can save a person's life, but more importantly, their brain. Because many times, people can survive, but their brain is dead. It happened actually to my grandmother when I was 10. My parents were, um, I don't remember where they were, but I was at home with my baby brother and my grandma, and she had an asthma attack, and I didn't realize how serious it was. So I went to get the neighbor, who was a police officer, because I knew he, he would know somebody who could help, right? But unfortunately, it took me too long to go get him and my grandma was clinically alive, but her brain was dead. And at 10, I did not understand really the extent of this until I read a book on first aid. And at 10 years old, I decided I will learn that. Because if I didn't know that, grandma would still be with us. And I didn't get that certification until I was in my 20s. So that day, 
And I have to renew that certification actually every two years for my business, for my license. But when I finally got certified with this, I was very grateful to the opportunity to be able to know that, that potentially I could save somebody's life one day. I've never had to use it, but I always think of my grandmother every time I take the course again. So breath is life. Breath is actually the only part of the body, nervous system, that is part of both the voluntary side and the autonomic side. Autonomic is what happens on its own. Voluntary is what we want to do. Like, if you decide I want to make my heart beat, well, it happens on its own, right? That's part of the autonomic system. Breath is the only function in the body that's part of both. Isn't that wonderful? And what happens when we're stressed? We stop breathing. And then we can think straight because the brain is not getting enough oxygen. Right? So we're going to do a little exercise together. Are you with me? It's a technique that I use a lot, especially when I'm driving. <laughs> Or I'm a stoplight, because driving, actually I, have a, I used to have a stick shift, so that was not very practical, but now I have an automatic, so that's much easier, actually. But we're going to take one hand, you feel free to use both, but we're going to take one hand and we're going to use two fingers. It's a technique called alternative, alternate nostril breathing, we mean, which means we're going to breathe alternatively from one nostril to another. And because we're not able to take as much air from one nostril as we are from two, it forces the, the nervous system to slow down. And there is a physiological reaction that happens in the body that it's physiologically impossible to stay stressed out at that level when we start breathing in this way. So if you ever find yourself in a situation where you go, First, you step away from the computer. Just kidding. But take a deep breath and then try not alternate nostril breathing. So we're going to take two fingers and when you close off your nostrils, make sure you do not press on the glands. You just push at the end of your nose. And we're going to start exhaling from the left because this is where the heart is. So we're going to block off the right nostril with one finger. Awesome. And we're going to exhale from the left. Got too many gadgets here. And then we're going to inhale from the left. Then we switch. We close off the left and we exhale from the right. And then we're going to inhale from the right. And then we switch. We exhale from the left. We switch again. I'm sorry, we inhale from left first. Switch fingers, we're going to exhale from right. And one more, we inhale from right. And exhale from left. You can do up to 10 reps if you want. If you are at the traffic light and you can only do three, go for it. So without getting too technical, there is actually also a left brain, right brain kind of interaction going on in the body. So whenever you feel yourself going in a thousand directions, right, you're pulled, you have to do this and your boss wants you to do that and your children want you to do this and then you forgot this project and then you have to pay this bill and, right? Does that sound familiar to anybody, right? Take a moment to take just a few breaths to recenter yourself 
with that breath. And guess what? Breath, breathing costs nothing. It's free. It's a tool we have 24-7 with us. Isn't that awesome? But we forget to use it. I actually have a story on this. If you don't mind me sharing stories. I love telling stories. I've been practicing yoga for 18 years. And breath work was the first thing that I learned. And I didn't get it right away. So I started yoga after my car accident. And I was seriously injured. I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour when I was at a complete stop. And because I saw it coming, I braced. <laughs> Wrong thing to do, but you don't think about it. And the seatbelt goes this way, so this shoulder was protected, but this one wasn't. So I had my arm on the steering wheel, and my body went forward. But this arm went back. So this shoulder got pretty damaged. And after several months of therapy, a friend of mine suggested that I do yoga. It's great for pain management. I'm like, okay, I'm going to sign up for classes. And there was an instructor right next to my house who was offering a 10 um, package. Of you get uh, you bought 10 and you would get uh, 12 classes total, something like that. So I signed up and got the package. Now, mind you, I had never done yoga in my life. Um, I was always athletic because growing up, uh, I was a ballerina, I played tennis, I did horseback riding, um, I did gymnastics, you name it. My parents registered us in everything because we lived in a small condo and the school was literally across the street and mom wanted us out. So she registered us in everything there was. Um, so having been athletic all my life, here I was. I was, uh, I just turned 30. Uh, I just turned 30. And I felt crippled physically and emotionally. My thoughts were yak, 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 and why, 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 why? So I'm in class. And first class of yoga, there's like 15 people in class and everybody can twist their bodies like a pretzel. And I'm like, I don't belong here. Why did my friend recommend that I take this class? This is not for me. This is way more advanced than what I can do. Thoughts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? I couldn't move my arm, I couldn't raise my arm. There were so many things I couldn't do. And I swear the teacher was reading my mind because we had to fill out this waiver, right? Tell about our injuries. And she would say, do not compare yourself to what you used to be able to do. Take today as today. And I'm thinking, yeah, right. I used to be able to do that, this, those things. I was a ballerina for six years. And then later on, she would say, do not compare yourself to anybody else in class. And my inner voice goes, what do you mean? That's a group class. Of course I'm going to compare myself to everybody in this class. Isn't that the purpose of a class? And I was the little sister for many years until my baby brother was born. So, and I was in the same classes as my brother and sister. So being the little one, I had to work twice, sometimes three times as hard to beat them. So I had this very competitive thing. So for me, being in a class where we're not comparing ourselves to anybody else was totally foreign concept. And so for the first few classes, I had this little monkey voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I couldn't get into any of the poses. When I say any, Standing was for probably the only thing with my, the lower part of my body was fine, but anything else, forget it. And then she kept talking about the breathing, the deep breathing, the yogi breath. I'm like, okay, it's like a deep breathing from the back of the throat. Kind of goes like this.
And after class number four, I think it was, I thought, you know what? I can do any of those poses. Forget about the poses. I'm going to focus on the breath thing she's talking about. Because that, I can do. And I felt empowered. There is something I can do in this class. Yeah. And guess what happened? As soon as I started focusing on my breath, it was almost like she said, her voice was in the background. And all I could hear was my own breath. And guess what happened? That warrior pose that kind of looks like this. I went into it like I'd been practicing yoga forever. And something in my body let go because I used my breath to help change that yak, 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 yak. So, first pillar is thought, second pillar is breath. Our thoughts, if they are negative, can make our breath shallow. When we become aware of this, we can use our breath to bring more oxygen. And then that will help change our thoughts and unlock something that's locked inside us. Isn't that wonderful? Now, mind you, just practicing breath, and, uh, what I call conscious breathing daily, doesn't mean it comes automatically. Because I have another story to share. Several years ago on New Year's Eve, we got robbed. I was gone from the house less than 20 minutes. And when I got home and realized we had been robbed, I was already inside the house when I saw everything upside down. And I was looking for my cell phone on me and I couldn't find it. And I thought, I need to get to the end of the house to grab where the phone was and get out. But I wasn't sure if there was still somebody in the house. And by the time I got out, I literally collapsed on my knees on the driveway. And I was down in 911, and all, that, all I could do was like, we've been robbed, we've, we've been robbed. And the woman, the dispatcher said, Miss, I want you to stop talking right now and stop breathing. Now mind you, I had been at that time 15 years in yoga. And I was like, oh yeah, breathing. And she's like, I want to hear you breathe three deep breaths. And I went back to life. So just because we practice it on a daily basis, when you have something with a severe shock, you need somebody to say, hey. And this is what I talk about, community. If the dispatcher had not been there to tell me, take a deep breath, I would have passed out. And they, they would not have found where I was. So thought and breath are first two pillars. Are you still with me? Yes. Awesome. Water is our third pillar. Who can tell me how much water is enough water? Eight glasses, I hear. I hear 64 ounces. What else? Yes, it's a formula. Because when I read in magazines that we've been perpetrating a lot of myths in the literature and culturally, when they say eight glasses or approximately 64 ounces of water per day, I'm sorry, are you built like Shaquille O'Neal or Mother Teresa? Yes. When we present it this way, it's pretty obvious that their needs are going to be completely different, right? So when you base it on your individuality and individual weight, that formula was actually um, originated from a doctor, an Indian doctor, an Indian MD, called Dr. Batman Jilib. 
and he wrote a book brought, uh, read, um, titled uh, You're Not Sick, You're Thirsty. And uh, in the book, he talks about how when his patients would come and see them, the first prescription or recommendation he would give them is, I want you to drink this much water. And he would take their weight, divide that by two ounces, said that's how many ounces of water I want you to drink, and come back and see me in two weeks. And guess what? They got better. So in subsequent uh, presentations, we'll talk more about the quality of water or lack thereof, because it may sound like a totally politically incorrect statement, but water is not created equal. I was at a meeting several months ago and this gal said, ah, water is water. I'm like, I'm sorry, but it's not. And I will prove you that it's not. So she has yet to take me up on this, but water is not water. And especially here in, in the St. Pete, Tampa Bay area, the water is pretty hard, pretty bad, actually. So <clears throat> the water we use to drink, as well as the water we use to shower with, Think about how many toxins are in there. The other day I was um, at a meeting, kind of a little conference thing, and the person who was interviewing me said, well, if you were to summarize in one, one word, what is the reason why people get sick? What is the common denominator why people get sick. And I said, I cannot give you just one because there are several, but, so those 10 pillars are based on that, but if I were to summarize the top three common denominators as to why people get sick, they're toxic, they're stressed, and they're malnourished. So when you think about where do toxins come from? Everywhere. Water that we drink, some of it, depending on where we get it from, is going to contribute to poor health. Stress. We have emotional stressors, physical stressors, chemical stressors. Stress is toxic. Toxins are stressful. And then, We'll talk more about food in a moment, but we're malnourished. And not just physically malnourished, emotionally. What do you feed your thoughts with? Right? So when you think about it, it's all connected. Make sense? So you'll see me, I travel with those. And I actually have a bigger one. And I have a, a system in my house for good water. So I just travel with this. I like drinking out of glass. And it has a wide opening. I don't like drinking out of a straw or drinking out of a small opening. It doesn't work for me. Um, so I've broken a few, but I just buy this. It's not the brand that I drink, but I just bought it because I wanted a glass bottle and I like it. And it fits in my little purse. So it's convenient for me. But it's clean water. So one of us will be doing a presentation on water and we'll teach you a lot more about that. So stay tuned for more. Sleep and RR. What do you do for fun? Do you work all the time or do you get time? Do you have fun? If I were to prevent you from sleeping for 72 hours, first you would hate me. We don't want that. But your body and your organs 
would shut down one after the other and you would die. So when we think about health, the immediate thing that people think when they say, yeah, I want to be healthy, New Year's resolutions, I'm going to be on a diet and I'm going to exercise. And they never sleep. I'm like, well, when do you rest? Sleeping is when the body repairs. You give it time to repair itself so that it can function better. If you never sleep, it's not going to happen. So sleep before food is one of the pillars. So I kind of put the pillars in an order of, I was going to say preferences, the one that impact the other. But sleep comes before water, because if you don't eat for three days, you're not going to die. You might be famished and tired and not thinking straight, but you're not going to die. If you don't sleep for 72 hours, you will. So some of you may say, well, that's fine and dandy, Isabel, but I fall asleep fine, but I can't stay asleep. My mind goes yak, 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 yak. Or you may be one of those who cannot fall asleep. And then eventually, around 4 in the morning, you finally fall asleep, and then the alarm goes off at 6. So if it sounds like you, we need to talk. I'll tell you what, I have a little routine to go from my day 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 go 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 meetings, phone calls, all kinds of things to now it's time for R&R for me. And I literally unplug. My phone is in the office. The computer is in the office. I shut everything off and I go take a bath with dead sea salt water and some essential oils that are therapeutic grades. And this is zen. And that set the tone because dead sea salt is high in magnesium. You can use Epsom salt. But it's high in magnesium, um, it's, um, potassium, sodium, obviously, but lots of trace minerals that are very quickly absorbable by the body through the skin. And the magnesium helps your body relax and help sleep. So you can create a little routine. If you're a parent, have you ever, ever read a book to your kids to help them sleep? Yeah. Do you do that for yourself? Do you read a fun light book? Or do you watch the news? <laughs> You're laughing, but the news are 99.9% .9 negative. Right? Are you on the computer until you go to bed? Are you on the phone until you go to bed? So many electromagnetic things going on around you. Of course your mind is not going to shut off because it goes So think about your routine. What do you do for yourself? What is the one degree of change you're going to make to help improve your sleep? Are you keeping the phone in the bedroom as your alarm clock? If this sounds like you, you might be a redneck. Just kidding. <laughs> If this sounds like you, you need to change that behavior because that is preventing you from having a good night's sleep. I'm glad we're laughing because laughing is good for relaxation, isn't it? I went to a class, it was a um, laughing meditation class. I think that's what they call it. And for an hour, we're just laughing. It was awesome. It works your abs to begin with. 
So laughing, resting, having fun, sleeping is part of staying healthy. If that's an area you need to work on and um, you need either myself or one of the other presenters to help you, we can help you. Sounds good? But think about the one degree of change that you're going to make if this is an area that uh, you need help with. So, the next pillar is food. My favorite. I'm French, Italian, and Spanish. Wow. Right, what a combination. I love food. But I love real, wholesome, nutritious food. We have been bombarded for decades in thinking that food is the enemy. Fats are bad. Red meat is evil. Sugar is a monster. What else? Chocolate is evil, but it tastes so good. <laughs> and then we're constantly conflicting between what we should be eating, but what we really want to be eating. And then we're cutting calories and... No. Food itself is not the enemy. What we do to it, meaning the nutrients we strip from it and the chemicals we add to it. Those are the enemies. But guess what? It's finally coming to light. But for 40 something years it's been pushed down and we've been fed, no pun intended, that all those food groups are bad. The majority of my clients are women, every single one of them, and they are between the ages mid-40s to mid-60s. Every single one of them has a hormonal issue, and at some point in her life was on a fat-free diet, which for years inhibited a hormonal production. If this sounds like you, we need to talk. Fat is not bad. There are different kinds of fats. See, in the field of wellness and nutrition, and it's very politically incorrect because fats aren't created equal either. There are different kinds of fats. Some that, yes, must be, we stay away from, like trans fat. Trans fat is a industrial type of fat. It does not exist in this particular form in most foods. We create it. Sugar, is it sugar from a fruit, from a beet, from a carrot? Or is it produced in a lab? It's not the same kind of sugar. So remember this, food is not the enemy. Chemicals are. One class that I teach uh, my clients is I take them to the grocery store to teach them how to read food labels. And not just content of fats, sugar, proteins, and that, but really what's in it? What is in the food that you're buying and eating and feeding yourself and your family? Are you buying food? Or are you buying a bunch of chemicals? If your food is nutrient dense, then it will feed you. If it isn't, then you'll be malnourished. So I'm going to need two more volunteers, and you're going to give me something, but I promise I will give it back to you. I need somebody to give me a $1 bill, and I need somebody to give me a $20 bill, just for the purpose of demonstration. Okay, Steve is my man. He's volunteering and he's giving me the 20. Yes. 
All right. I have a 22, but I'll let you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I promise I will give them back. So, we've got two dollar bills here. One is one dollar, the other one is 20. I'm gonna put them on top of one another. They're the same size, right? They're about the same thickness. They feel the same. They smell the same. If I were to close my eyes and mix them up, I would not know which one is which, right? So when it comes to food, sometimes people say, yeah, but healthy and organic food is more expensive. And I'm gonna tell you to the contrary, it's a lot cheaper. On the surface, it looks more expensive. But what is the value, nutritionally speaking, of what you're eating, putting in your mouth? I'll take an example of an apple. Or any, yeah, an apple. If I buy a non-organic apple, from a nutritional standpoint, it's gonna give me the value of one dollar. When I get an organic apple, it will be smaller by size, about half the size of a non-organic apple. It won't be nice and shiny, but nutritionally speaking, it's going to have the value of that twenty dollar. So when we look at food, we're looking at nutrient density. How much bang for my buck am I getting out of that dollar that I spend on food? Are you buying empty foods? There is no nutrients, there is no fiber, there is no minerals, no vitamins, nothing. Or does it have a lot of things that with just one bite, it feels very filling. Have you ever had some food and you take one bite and it's like, wow, this is filling? Yeah, it's nutrient dense. So, are we comparing apples to apples? Do you want the $1 bill or the $20 bill? Come on, that's a no-brainer. Yeah. So thank you very much for letting me borrow your money. I'll put it back here. So when it comes to food, food is not created equal. Yikes. Okay. Movement is our next pillar. Notice here that I did not say exercise. Because movement is not just exercise. Exercise is one kind of movement. But think about movement, the ability to move full range of motion without pain. What a concept. Chiropractor will understand that very well. But think about what else is blocked in me. Remember that yoga sto story with I was blocked, my thoughts were blocked, my breath was blocked. There was no communication here between the brain and the rest of the body. How do we have and create movement in the body? What is the first tool we can use to create movement in the body? It was one of our pillars. Yes, breath. We can recreate movement in the body by breathing. So when we say, well, I don't have time to exercise, it's okay. You can still move, right? 
So if you have blockage somewhere, and when I say movement, you can create movement through breath, through breath, through chiropractic care, massage, acupuncture, Reiki, um, thought process, walking, exercise, but it's also bowel movement. People who are constipated or sick, I know it's not a topic we you know, typically talk about on stage, but it's important. If you're not eliminating what the body is not using, you will become very toxic. So, movement is important, and we can create movement with breath. Yeah. <coughs> sunlight. Why is sunlight important? Vitamin D? Yes, elevates the mood. Have you ever seen a plant grow with no light? Have you ever noticed how people who work at night, they work a night shift? They're not very happy people. And up north, we're lucky here, we're in Florida, right? But up north, people get the the sad syndrome because they don't see enough sunlight. How many minutes a day do we need of sunlight for the body to absorb sufficiently? Yeah, about 20 minutes. We don't need to fry ourselves. 20 minutes a day of sunlight now, I'm going to tell you something that is probably against the traditional belief system. Because every June, every summer, guess what? We are bombarded and thinking you must put sunscreen on your body. But they don't tell us what kind of sunscreen. And the majority, we're going to talk about this in just a moment, the majority of the sunscreens on the market, over 72% of them actually, are filled with carcinogenic ingredients. Yikes. How about, you know, we need to put sunscreen because we're going outdoors. It will take 48 hours for the vitamin D to go from your skin into your bloodstream. When we put sun lotion on, the vitamin D cannot penetrate into the skin. So the first 20 minutes, go without anything. Then if you're gonna stay out longer than 20 minutes, protect yourself. But be mindful about the brands you pick and choose to put on your body, just like food. It's not just what we put in our bodies, it's what we put on our bodies and around our bodies that will affect us. So that vitamin D, as soon as your um, skin changes, um, like becomes pink. Now, if you're darker skin, you may not see that it becomes pink, so you know, keep a watch, but it will take 20, 20 minutes, that's all you need. But it will take 48 hours for that vitamin D to go from your skin into your bloodstream. So we see those commercials and they laser the soap on the body and all that. Well, guess what? All that vitamin D now is down the, the drain. So watch the important parts. But arms and legs, do we need to put that much soap on them? Probably not, unless you've been working in the yard and playing in the sand, you're probably not that dirty. Make sense? So, just like plants, we need sunlight. Get as much as possible. Environment. So when I talk about environment, our next pillar, it's our immediate environment, home office, but it's also the town we live in, the state we live in, the country we live in, can we impact the environment? Yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Positively and negatively. That one degree of change, the choices we make 
when we purchase things will have an impact on our health, on our community, on the environment. What is the one degree of change you can make today to have a better impact on the environment? Those water bottles that you purchase every week, made out of plastic, how many of them end up hopefully in the recycling bin, but nonetheless, there are many other ways to get clean water. Now, of course, if you're traveling, you know, you cannot bring your beverage with you when you go through security at the airport, so you're going to have to buy water. But other than that, there are many ways we can impact our environment positively or negatively. What is the one degree of change that we can use to make that? Now, our environment, obviously, is going to also impact everything else in our um, lifestyle because, and you may notice this more when you travel, you may not find the same kind of foods from one state to the other, or if you travel to a different country, it's even more so, right? So are we impacted by the environment we live in? Absolutely. Can we make changes to make it better? Absolutely. So we'll talk more again in one of our future presentations, but today we're just laying the ground. Relationships. Very important. We were talking about community earlier. Who are the life suckers in your life? <laughs> Aha, you have some too. On the flip side, who are the people who energize you? You meet some people and you feel like you've known them forever. And sometimes you meet other people and you're like, whoa, what was that? And I see people go, yeah, I can relate, right? And it's not easy to get rid of the life suckers in the lives. But what is the one degree of change you can make to separate yourself physically and emotionally from those vampires? So work in progress, but think about who in your life is causing stress. Who in your life is causing that shallow breath? Who in your life is causing the negative thoughts? Can we change our relationship with those negative relationships, negative people, using our thoughts, our breath, movement? Exercise can be a stress relief. Do you see how they all impact one another? So out of those pillars, there may be some that are easier for you to tackle right away, and that's fine. But because they're not always 100% optimal, becoming aware of where are the gaps where things aren't really where I want them to be, this is what we need to tackle first. And what other tool from my pillars can I utilize to make that change, to impact that particular pillar that's really not working so well for me. Make sense? And tap into those relationships that on the up, they just lift you up, they give you ideas. You meet some people and you run a, a problem by them as like, well, have you considered that angle, right? Because sometimes, like if I look at things from here, okay, they look a certain way, and then I'm gonna be moving over there, Oh, well, it kind of looks different, right? And then I may go even closer, oh, it looks very different. So different perspective, and those people in our relationships, our circles, can help us with that. We all have those, right? 
the positive people in our lives? Yay! But identify the vampires. And what is the one degree of change you can do to distance yourself from those? So this word hygiene is kind of a broad term because I'm assuming, you know, we have running water and we live in the United States, so we're pretty clean, right? But when I talk about hygiene, it's much beyond that. When was the last dental office you know, visit you had? Did you do dental cleaning? Do you keep yourself in check? What skincare products do you use? Are they full of chemicals that should probably not be touching your skin? Did you know that the European Union for the last 20 years has banned over 1,400 different types of ingredients scientifically proven to be harmful to human health. 1,400. There's actually 1,469 as of today. And they keep growing. Every time a chemical comes on the market, if it's harmful to human and that particular product that the manufacturer makes has that ingredient, it will be banned from being in, in cosmetics and makeup and um, things we use on the body. So think about shampoo, conditioner, body wash, toothpaste, shaving cream. In the US, out of those 14 plus 100, we only have 30 that are restricted. Yes, not 30,000, 30. Yes, wow, scary. So, what type of skincare products are you buying? And by the way, the word natural doesn't mean anything because it's not even regulated. So, there is a great website that you can check out. It's one of them. There is actually four or five um, in existence, but it's the Environmental Working Group website, ewg.org. They have reviewed over 80,000 different types of cosmetics, including baby products. So you scroll down the home page and you go to the tab that says um, cosmetics, skin care, skin deep. And you type ABC brand, whatever product. And they have rated from 1 to 10 the level of toxicity of products that you're, whatever brand you type in. So the lower the grade, the better. It's the opposite of school. If you get a 1, that means in terms of toxicity levels, it's very low. They look at three criteria. Allergens, development, brain development, and cancer. So the rating, overall rating, is based on those three criteria. So if you're in a green bubble, you're in a safe product. If you're in a yellow bubble, like if the grade of the product you just type in is yellow, that means it's moderately unsafe, you should consider changing soon. And if you're red zone, the red bubble, toxic, throw away, substitute with a safer brand. When I work one-on-one -on -one with clients, especially my women clients who have hormonal issues, that's the first homework assignment I give them. And it is an assignment because it takes time. The average woman uses 12 products before she leaves the house. Between the shampoo, the conditioner, the body wash, the body lotion, the foundation, the mascara, the eyeshadow, the lipstick. Did I forget anything? 
deodorant, and men use an average of six. So working towards recreating health in the body, and we're looking at the foundation, we need to look at what are we doing every single day. And so when you lay out your products, you're probably going to have four piles. The safe zone, the yellow zone, the red zone, and then some a product may not have been reviewed. So if you'd like, after you do your homework online, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I use several brands for myself. I used to purchase all my products from Europe and it became very pricey to do this way. Because every time I would go back to France, I would bring back a suitcase of stuff. I would pack my suitcase in my suitcase and then I would come back with two pieces of luggage and then they started charging for the extra luggage. And so my husband was like, we need to start this. It's costing $100 extra to bring this bag back. So my husband is a cyclist and uh, he spends a lot of time outdoors. So we go through a lot of sun lotion that I would purchase by the case coming back from France. And one year we, we didn't go back to France for several years, so we eventually ran out. So I went to the Environmental Working Group website and I found a safe sun lotion. And I've incorporated that brand into my, not only my life, but into my practice as well. So now I'm able to give a tool to my clients. So if this is the case for you and you're not sure which brand to pick, give me a call or email me and we can chat. I can direct you and, and give you some options. So with that being said, I want to thank you again for being here tonight. We'll stay behind for a few minutes if you have any one-on-one -on -one questions.